you're going into nursing, boy, do we need you. <laughs> There's an anticipation of a shortage of approximately one million nurses in the United States by the year 2020. And that alone is going to cause additional crisis for our healthcare system, as we will be seeing in sort of over the next few minutes. Um, to talk about our healthcare system in one hour is quite a challenge, uh, but I like challenges. I run a very open seminar concept, so I invite your questions, your issues, your thoughts as we're going along. Don't hold them off till the end. And again, we have about an hour together, I believe, is what we have, right? So let's go forward. I in order to look forward, I always like to look a little bit backwards. So we're going to go a little bit historically back. Perhaps some of us will remember some of these days. In the United States, in 1950, we were spending $12.7 billion annually on health care. In 1965, we were at $41.1 billion. <coughs> and something very interesting happened in 1965. What was it? Medicare. Yeah, Medicare and Medicaid are two programs that provide our forms of national health insurance. Those are our forms of national health insurance. That's what was implemented in 65 and 66. As a result, we started seeing health care expenditures starting to go up. By 1970, we were at $74.9 billion. By 1980, at $253.9 billion. Exactly. This started causing a lot of consternation in our country and a lot of consternation in Congress. If you read the congressional testimony, you will see that Congress was very concerned about this level of, health, of healthcare expenditures and started implementing policies to deal with this rising cost of healthcare in the United States. Very concerned about this. And private insurance companies started mimicking what the federal government was doing. By 1985, however, we were already up to $428.7 billion, and there was an indication that perhaps we had a system that was starting to get out of control. By 1989, $623.5. And look at these annual increases in health care expenditures as we move through these years. They go up by $100 billion, $75 to $100 billion at a shot. Then they start slowing down in terms of the rate of increase right about in here. 1995, 1996, where we're now at a trillion dollars of healthcare expenditures. What started going on right about 93, 94, 95, 96? Aging, of the Aging was going on, but there's something that was starting to slow down our healthcare costs as well. Our slow managed healthcare. Managed healthcare, exactly. This was HMO time. Okay? This is something that caused lots of sighs and groans in our society, but this started putting a little bit of a break on our healthcare expenditures right at this point in time. 97, 98, we're now at 1.2 trillion, 1.3 trillion, 1.4 trillion, and now we start seeing some remarkable increases again in healthcare expenditures. So by the year 2005, sorry, 2007, we're at 2.3 trillion dollars, and the estimate is that in the next seven years, will be at $4 trillion of health care expenditures. Now, those are huge numbers, but it's sort of hard to understand what they really mean. So let me put this in perspective in terms of what it means. Oh, by the way, just by a, a note, we're at $2.3 trillion currently in 07, expectation of $4 trillion by the year 2015. Both of our candidates have health care plans that are being discussed right now. I'm not going to spend huge amounts of time on it, but I will reflect on elements of it as we're going along. But it should be noted that even though we're at $2.3 trillion currently in health care expenditures, the McCain health care plan, which is, quote, less costly plan, would, according to the Tax Policy Center, a very highly respected group, non-political, apolitical, has estimated that the McCain health care plan would cost $1.3 trillion dollars over the next 10 years. The Obama plan would cost 1.6 trillion dollars over the next 10 years. So that's if, in addition to the health care expenditures I've just laid out. So both of these are very expensive plans regardless of who you ultimately vote for or already have voted for over the next few days. Let me get a little bit more comfortable. Let me put this in perspective in terms of what these health care expenditures mean. We can talk about health care expenditures as a percentage or a slice of the pie of total economic activity. Gross domestic product, you'll hear your various newscasters in the evening talking about 
<coughs> healthcare expenditures in the form of GDP. GDP, gross domestic product, is your total value of economic activity in a country. So in 1940, healthcare made up 4% of the pie of economic activity, leaving 96% left over for everything else that we value in our society. So that was, everything else was left over for housing and clothing and defense systems and police and fire and going to the movies and going to Disney World and going on a trip. Okay. 1940, 4%. 1960, 5.2% of the pie. And again, in 1965, we implement, we passed Medicare and Medicaid and implemented the following year. Where we're at about just under 6% of a slice of the pie going to health care, leaving again the rest of the pie left over for everything else we value in our society. So there still was 94% of the pie left over for everything else we want and need in our society. 1970, 7.2%. And now watch what starts happening. 1980, 9.1% of the pie starts going to health care, leaving only a little bit over 90% of the pie left over for everything else we value in our society. Again, if you read the congressional testimony, right around 1980, Congress starts saying we can never allow, never allow health care to go double digit in terms of a percentage of gross domestic product. It's untenable. Can't happen will not happen. Again, lots of regulations put on, and sure enough, lo and behold, we go double digit in 1985 at 10.4%, 11.6% four years later. Here, healthcare is just eating up the pie, leaving everything else to diminished forms. 13.4% in 92. Again, what starts happening right around here in 1992, 93? The implementation of health maintenance organizations, HMOs, managed care, and it now starts stabilizing a little bit. Okay? Starts stabilizing right at about 13.6, 13.7%. Pretty stable. A little breath of air. Yes, please. In the slide that you showed of the two candidates. Yes. That would be a total over the next 10 years. But realize that in, so that would take you to the year 2018. We right now estimate that by the year 2015 we'll be at four trillion. So of healthcare with not, neither of these policies put into place, this would put it over five trillion for either of these programs. Okay? So basically a 20% increase in healthcare expenditures from either plan, the McCain plan or the Obama plan. 13.6% of GDP. 13.7, and now again, watch what starts happening. In recent years, healthcare starts picking up a larger and larger piece of the pie again. Look at these in, in annual increases in bites of the pie as it's picking up larger and larger slices. What's causing this? What happened all of a sudden? Well, we started getting a little bit complacent. We started saying, you know what? We hate managed care, we hate HMOs, and you know what? Right around this period of time, 2000, 2001, 1999, 2000, 2001, the economy started looking, was pretty good shape, was in very good shape. Okay? And so we said, employers started saying, hey, you know what? Let's start giving employees a little bit more in terms of benefits. Let's start getting moving away from managed care, let's move away from HMOs. And you start taking your foot off the brake pedal, and the car just starts speeding right back up again, and that's exactly what started happening. We got comfortable. And so look at this. We have a system basically under, out of control. In 2007, federal estimates, we always were waiting lag times in terms of getting federal estimates, we're at 16.8%. The estimate is that by the year 2015, which is only seven years away from now, we're going to be at one-fifth of all economic activity. One out of every five dollars of economic activity will go to health care in this country. Just by comparison, okay, at 16.8 percent right now, 20 percent by 2015, if we look at right now, how much does defense make up of GDP? Any ideas? 
40%? That's all? All your defense expenditures, all our Iraqi activity, all of that stuff, 4% of GDP. By comparison, health care, 16.8% of GDP. I always plant somebody in my audience to ask a question for the next slide I'm going to bring up. Okay. And collect your $10 on the way out again. Thank you. This is to get point of a comparison where I could get one year where we have a number of countries that have different health care systems. Again, let's go back to 2004. In the U.S., we're at 15.9% of GDP, okay? almost 16% of economic activity going to health care. Okay. United Kingdom. 8.1%. By the way, by the way, just before I look at these a little bit more closely, I want to point out a couple of things. Okay? With our 16.8% currently of GDP going to health care, we have in the United States 47 million uninsured people in the United States. 47 million uninsured. Okay? We do not have universal health care. Absolutely. It adds, to, it adds to the cost. As I'll show you in a little bit. By the way, this is the number you hear on the TV all the time and on the internet and wherever you're looking for your sources in the, in the newspaper. Be aware, this comes from the American Medical Association, whereas you have 47 million uninsured, you have 89.5 million at any given month. Right? 89.5 million of the un have people have been uninsured for at least one month during the year. So even though you do not count as the uninsured because you have insurance right now, 89.5 million people at one point during the year, at least for one month, are lacking health insurance. They're going there. And furthermore, if no policy is enacted, it's estimated that by the year 2018, 10 years away, there'll be 67 million uninsured in the United States. Please. Ranges from, and I've read two sets of figures from two different sources. The low number, 20 million underinsured. The high number, 60 million underinsured. Okay? What is underinsurance? It's people who don't have enough insurance to care, take care of their needs. Their deductibles are too high. Their co-payments are too high. People who are on Medicare but do not have any supplemental Medicare are in this, will fall into this trap sometimes if they are lower income Medicare, et cetera. So, the underinsured adds to this problem. So going back to this slide here, oh, and let me just show you one more thing before I go on. Again, going to the two health care plans. McCain's health care plan, if it's enacted, there would still be in the year 2018, 64.8 million uninsured 10 years from now. Right? If the Obama health care plan is enacted, there would be, in the year 2018, we still don't get rid of the uninsured. Still, even with the Obama plan, we would still have estimated to be 33 million uninsured in the year 2018, 10 years away. Please. How is that possible? There was only a, a $0.3 billion difference trillion. between the two plans. Trillion. 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 Oh, mm -hmm. trillion, right. Yeah. But how do you explain 30 million people covered by that small amount? Completely different methodologies in terms of how the systems are set up where, again, as you hear in the news, the, the McCain plan is focused on taxing employer base, which means that they expect that 20 million people will move away from employer-covered insurance as a result. So all of a sudden, they would add to your uninsured. The implementation of the tax credits would buy you back about 22 million of those people. So your net gain would only be 2 million insured in the McCain plan. The Obama plan has a very different focus in that it will take the people who are currently insured and add more people to the insured roles by using methodologies focused initially on children and then other people who have lack of insurance to get into these plans. 
so. It's just a different focus on how they're set up. And again, it's not to create judgment. I'm not meaning to judge one plan over the other. That's not my purpose. I, that's now, never how I teach. I only provide information. Way back in 93, when they were uh, saying that Hillary's health care would take over 7% of our economy, <laughs> that really was understating it by about 100%. Yeah, it? just about. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. It's interesting when we think back to the Hillary plan, you know, when I talk to my, my undergraduate students, they say, Hillary what? And it's like, it's like, it's like, it was before they were born, even though it seems like yesterday for all of us who are experiencing that whole situation, that whole system, that the Hillary plan, interestingly enough, large parts of the Hillary plan have been implemented, but they've been implemented at the state level, okay? And so you see lots of the components, never t totally taken and put into effect and plugged in, but you see lots of pieces of the Hillary plan that have been implemented at the state level. I mean, you take into a look at states like Massachusetts or Maine or things like or where you see implementation. It's very interesting to see. So going back to your question, which I still haven't answered, about these other countries. Right? And using 2004 as our consistent number, where I figures for everybody, U.S. at 15.4 percent of GDP with 47 million uninsured. The United Kingdom at 8.1% of gross domestic product, okay? And again, United Kingdom, with all of its faults, has comprehensive universal health care for its population, please. Is that population total both legal and illegal? It's a very good question. The, the figures that are provided are for the legal population. Figures that are provided are for legal population, so the illegal population just adds to the issue, adds to the issue because there's not coverage for them as well. Yes, please. When you're using a figure there, let's say for the GDP, are you taking into consideration co-payments, deductibles, everything out of pocket? This is total health care expenditures, exactly. Those figures aren't correct. They come from the World Health, World health Organization, which is about as correct an organization as you can get to. Payments that they've now instituted, the same thing with France and Canada. And if you want first aid coverage, you have a right. supplemental on top of that, which is deductible out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. So you might be looking at almost 35% for national health care. Um, I would have to really look at those figures because I know how the WHO puts its health figures together. And again, those same figures are used for the U.S.'s methodology in terms of it because this is, again, total personal health care expenditures. So this goes into the pot, including co deductibles and co-pays. So uh, please send me the figures and, and, and I'll be happy to I'll give you my card afterwards. This says nothing about the quality of the health care. It says nothing about the quality of the health care, but I'm going to talk about that also, okay? I've got some indications of that. Quality is probably better. It is. But it's... Uh... It may well be. Well, uh, we'll talk about that also. Japan, again, from the World Health Organization, World Health Statistics, um, 07 figures. Uh, Japan at 7.8%, again, with a comprehensive health care system. Canada, just to the north of us, 9.8% of GDP. It's oftentimes we hear about should the Canadian system be implemented here. They have one, uh, one payer program. You have the government as the only payer of government of health care services. Again, it's a, it's a question. I mean, and again, you look at these figures and you realize that when you look at Canadians, they sort of look like us. They sort of act sort of like us. And they sort of seem to be just about as healthy as us. So you look at these differences in figures and you wonder. Right? France at 10.5%. Switzerland, if you'd like to have their system, which is a little bit more expensive, but certainly not up to the U.S. level. Switzerland is 11.5% of GDP. And Switzerland, by the way, their system also includes um, massage as part of their health care provision, okay, <laughs> under their health care system. It's therapeutic massage. Don't get any ideas. And Germany at 10.6%. I want to put it into, into context one other way. U.S. national health care expenditures per person in the United States. How much do we spend for every man, woman, and child for health care in the United States? In 1950, we were spending $70 for every 
man, woman, and child. I have this great slide that I use in one of my classes. It's a slide, the original price list for surgical procedures at Mercy Hospital, which is here in town. And they have, uh, for the use of the emergency room, it's a typed page. I still have the original. It's a typed page. It says, it says uh, use of operating room, uh, moderate level surgery, $25. Complex surgery, thirty-five dollars. That was nineteen fifty, right at this time. Okay. So we were spending seventy dollars for every man, woman, and child for health care in the United States. In nineteen sixty, we're at one hundred and forty-eight dollars for every man, woman, and child for health care in the United States. Again, Medicare and Medicaid implemented in sixty-five at two hundred eleven per person, and now we're up on the roller coaster again by nineteen eighty, eleven hundred and two. It's interesting. Anybody read Lee Iacocca's autobiography ever? It was a book that was out in right around this period of time. I remember sitting on a beach on the west coast of Florida with my wife and reading that book when it came out. And Lee Iacocca had a very interesting statement in there. In 1980, in 1980, he says, he says, how can we compete globally in a global economy when for every car I build at Chrysler Corporation, when he was CEO of Chrysler, he'd been the found, he was the inventor of the Ford Mustang as well, brilliant guy in terms of business acumen. How are we going to compete globally when for every car I build, one door of that car, of that four-door car, goes to health care costs for my employees? That was 1980. 1980. Almost 30 years ago. And of course, you're right. Chrysler is almost gone now, okay? So he, he read the tea leaves perfectly. He knew exactly what was going to be going on. 1980, over $1,000 for every man, woman, and child, but we weren't done yet. Five years later, we had $2,500 for every man, woman, and child. 1991, 3000 1997, 4000 2001, 5000 6,000 two years later, two years later, $7,500 for every man, woman, and child in the year 2007, $7,500. And again, how do you compete in a global economy when we're paying this amount for every man, woman, and child for health care, and because we have an employer-based system primarily, how do you compete? How do employers compete? My brother uh, works with software companies. Uh, he's with a startup right now out of the Silicon Valley. But he was the chief patent engineer for Adobe Software, major international corporation. My brother talked to me one day, which was nice of him. And, and, he, was, and he was discussing, he said, Steve, how is this going to work? When we hire a new engineer in Silicon Valley, San Jose, California, out of college, brand new engineer, cost us $60,000 plus health care benefits. When I go over to our operations in India, in Adobe had operations in India, we have engineers that are just as good, just as good, and I love interacting with them, and I interact with them by internet every night, when they're on their daytime and I'm on our nighttime, and we hire them for $12,000 a piece and at much lower health care benefits. And when you go to China and you go to the service sector there, their health care costs for a Chinese employee paid for by the government is about $150 a person per year. How are you going to compete? Good question. I'll come to that also. Very good question. This. You're, it's a very good question also, because this does not control for inflation purposefully, okay? Because I'm going to show you something about what is in these figures in the next slide or two also, okay? Again, another 10 bucks for that gentleman, please, mercy. <laughs> By the year 2015, seven years away, okay? When our students entering now will be coming out with their master's degree, that's all it takes, seven years, okay? will be at over $12,000 for every man, woman, child. And these are government estimates. Government estimates are always conservative, which means it's probably going to be worse than this. Please. Yeah, when they include these figures, do they include things like dental, disability, 
This does not include, I'm sorry, this does include dental. It, it does include the medical component of disability. It would not include any, any income associated with disability. But the medical component, yes. This is all personal health care expenditures, all. Mm -hmm. Just to make you happy. In terms, this is not some weird person stating this. The people stating this, that Medicare will become insolvent, i.e. no money, in the year 2019, which is 11 years away, 11 years away. This is the trustees overseeing the Medicare and Medicaid system and the Social Security system that are saying this. They're the ones who are saying this. Some estimates indicate that it might even be by the year 2014 to 2015 oh. that Medicare will be belly up. And there's nothing really being worked on in terms of dealing with that issue. Right? It's being totally underfunded, exactly. A little bit more about this relationship to other countries. U.S. national medical expenditures per person are more than 80% higher than in Canada. The U.S. national medical care expenditures per person are almost three times higher than the United Kingdom. And people in the United States are spending more on health care than on food and housing combined. And that's before the housing collapse. Again, this is why people are trying to make choices these days, even more so these days, about whether I put food on the table or whether I take my pharmaceuticals. It's a choice. Can't do both. And that's one of the cons issues with, this, with these costs as well. It's not just sort of interesting and intellectual. This is people. Real. Real. Exactly. Reality. Please. Hmm. That's part of it. And let me get into that because I think these are really interesting questions. We're getting into the questions of what underlies this. What are some of the quality issues? So let's get into the source of the problems, okay? Source of the problems. One of them, this is a good thing. There's an aging of the population, okay? I like that, personally. Okay? <laughs> but the realization is that as we have an aging of the population, people aged 65 years and over use twice as many medical services as compared to the young. And we have not even begun to see the explosive aspect of this. I want to show you this, okay? In 1995, there were 33.5 million people in the United States aged 65 and over. In the year 2000, 35.2 million people. But the year 2025, which is again only 17 years away, and again, 17 years goes like this. 17 years from now, there will be 60.6 .6 million people aged 65 and over, which means that we ain't seen nothing yet in terms of the increase in healthcare expenditures. This is a major, major issue. And it also is going to cause stress with cross generations because the way that the social security system is set up, the way the Medicare system is set up, is especially social security, is the way you pay social security, and this is sort of a misnomer that people don't really always see. There's a perception is I've paid into social security through my payroll taxes, and so at the end of the time, I bring my money out to support me. Doesn't work that way. Current workers support current retirees. Current workers support current retirees. Okay? So what's happening is we're having a flip-flop in terms of our populations. Earlier years, when Medicare was passed, for example, there were lots of people working and very few retirees. So the tax per person was very small. Today, or especially as we go into the year 2025, We'll have huge numbers of people retiring, and we'll have a much smaller labor force. So the tax per person to support all of these retirees will be significantly more. When I tell my, my students, who are younger, that this is going to be coming around the bend, and I also let them know that these people who are going to be retiring, those are me. These are the baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer. Okay? When us baby boomers retire, we vote. We're very active politically. We're going to make sure that our needs are taken care of. Okay? And there are going to be huge numbers of us. And we're going to put so much pressure on these kids 
17 years from now, when, they're, when I tell my students they're going to be about 35 or 40 and trying to raise their families and trying to get their situation together, and I want to make sure that they're taxed for every penny they got to make sure <laughs> that my retirement is taken care of, my medical care is taken care of. And that will cause intergenerational stress in our society. The sociologists are going to go crazy with this stuff. With the Gen Ys, the, the Gen Ys are what are called the shadow, the the shadow uh, boomers or the ghost boomers. Or yeah, that's the the next group that's coming through. But nobody has ever seen a situation like this where there'll be so many retirees putting so many demands on a health care system. I just want to show you by by um, by comparison, because the life expectancy today, well. Life expectancy today, I don't have it here. It's over 70, and I have another slide. Yeah, it's about 78 years of age. By the way, just by comparison, I want you to go back 100 years. 100 years ago, this was your average life expectancy in the United States. 46.6 if you were male white, 48.7 if you were male, I'm sorry, female white, 32 and a half years if you were black male, 35.5 years if you were black female. That was the life expectancy 100 years ago. So you can understand how quickly Life expectancies can escalate. You also realize how Medicare was ill-equipped for this, because when Medicare was passed, when Medicare was passed, 1965, what was the average life expectancy in the United States? 67.8 years. 67.8. So the concept was you retire at the age of 65, you collect medical care benefits for 2.8 years, and you drop dead. Okay? <laughs> and we could afford that. Now, we live forever, okay? And that puts a lot of stress and strain on the system. Please. How, how does Social Security complicate this even farther? Social Security is even more of a mess than Medicare. It's expected to go broke before Medicare goes broke. And again, your politicians, our politicians, are not doing anything looking a little bit longer term in terms of this. So the system is prone to total collapse. And nobody's talking about it. None of your presidential candidates are talking about it. None of your congressional candidates are talking about it. Nobody's talking about it. Why? Because you either have to reduce benefits or increase taxes. And nobody wants to. And, and exactly. It'll come down to the wire, and we're going to have to do a bailout of them. Retirement. Um, the retirement ages are about the same ages. Exactly. And in those countries, there tend to be sometimes more support systems provided for retirees as well than what we tend to have in the US where you're a little bit more on your own. Let me go to a couple more causes about why the costs have gone up so dramatically in the United States. Technological innovations, which in the United States, or not in the United States, period, in the world, technological innovations, by the way, just a side note, the aging of the population is not just a US issue. It's a worldwide issue. We've been holding special conferences on this. We just had a conference at the University of Miami just about two years ago where we had the ministers, these associate ministers of health for aging issues come to Miami and the ministers of health joined for one of the three days of the conference to talk about issues about aging and how it's going to be bankrupting economies around the world. There's only one section of the world, only one section of the world where aging is not an issue and not becoming an issue. And unfortunately, it's for all the wrong reasons that it's not an issue in that area of the world. What area of the world is it? Africa. Africa, and it's because of the AIDS epidemic. The AIDS epidemic is wiping out the aging issue. But in the rest of the world, aging is a significant issue. Technological innovations, which are cost increasing. For those of you who come from the manufacturing sector, when anybody introduces a new a new technological innovation, whether it be General Motors or Dell Computer or name the company. When you introduce a new technological innovation, what does it do to your costs? Why do you introduce it? It brings down your costs. It brings in you bring in technological innovations to bring down your costs. If you introduce robotics at General Motors to build cars, it's to bring your costs down. If you introduce a new methodology for producing coffee at Starbucks, it's to get your cost of producing a cup of Starbucks coffee to go down when they bring in that new espresso machine that they're all excited about, that's to bring your costs down. In the healthcare field, and this is what makes healthcare so fascinating, it doesn't work like any other sector. Technological innovations are cost 
increasing. When you introduce that new tech, new MRI scanner, that new PET scanner, those are all driving your costs up. Right? And I don't have it in this set of slides. I just gave a talk yesterday to the College of Engineering where they're talking about technological innovations in healthcare. And there's just been a whole set of articles being written and a whole pan a set panel of experts in the whole field of technological innovation that say that this is one of the, perhaps the most important driver in the cost of healthcare going up in the United States is, is, is pervasive use of technology. One of my favorite statistics. There are more MRI scanners in Orange County, California than there are in the entire country of Canada. Why? Because it makes money. It makes money. Okay? And the county's not far behind. Oh, the doctors love pushing you into that, actually, because it generates revenue for them. It generates revenue for them. It's a way of generating revenue. And exactly, the lawyers, the lawyers also, the, their, their pressures from, to, to practice defensive medicine. So there's a whole literature on this alone in terms of technological innovation. More services per person, okay? You tell me, because a lot of you are my age or so, you tell me about my physical 30 years ago when I went in for my annual physical. <laughs> Not even a chest x-ray, I didn't go that far. Yeah, I did the blood pressure, okay? I looked in my ears, had me either read the eye chart, I tap my knee, I listen to the stethoscope in my heart, I'm out of there. Okay? That was my physical. You tell me about my physical I just had last month. You tell me. Exactly. I had, I had an EKG. I had a full blood test. I had, I had the stress test. I have the colonoscopy scheduled for next month. Yes, thank you. Really looking forward to that. Okay? I don't even read the eye chart. They don't even have you read the eye chart anymore. They send you to the optometrist to read the eye chart because that's too technical for them. And so all of a sudden, the costs per person have gone up extremely as well. Then you add to that increases in price that have gone up, and prices go up at two to three times the rate of overall price structures in the economy. And that drives things up because you have so much market control in, this, in, in the healthcare uh, area, and you've got issues. So somebody asked me before, I said, well, hopefully at least we get awesome quality for everything we're spending on healthcare in the United States, because we spend so much on it, so much more than any of our other countries or neighbors. Okay? And here's what we see. This is one of your major healthcare indicators is, is, is life expectancy. Life expectancy basically says we put all of this healthcare into the pot, and hopefully you live a nice, long, quality life. Life expectancy in the United States from birth, we are ranked 48th in the world. 48th in terms of life expectancy for everything we spend on health care. We're below Andorra, who is number one, by the way. Macau, Australia, Gibraltar, Aruba, Greece, Martinique, Austria, New Zealand, heck, United Kingdom, Guam, we're even below Puerto Rico. We're below Bosnia and Herzegovina, for God's sake. And, and it's like... What's going on? The stress. The stress. And I'm just adding to that, obviously, right now. <laughs> Please. <laughs> how many countries are there? Now you're, I, I never, I always flunk geography. Anybody know how many countries there are in the world? I know we, I know we say at the, United, at the University of Miami proudly that we draw students from 143 different countries. So we have at least 143 countries. So, but this is, this is an issue, please. In Canada, if you need an MRI, you could wait six months. Yes, and you're absolutely right. In Canada, if you need an MRI, you can wait at least six months. And that's the difference between Orange County, where you can get one today and one six months ago. But the question is, and this is the question that's asked exactly, do you need it? Yes, you wait six months for it, but we are so prone to the technology that we have maybe lost track of the health care. And that's an issue. And it's not true just for MRIs. It's for the waiting in line to get their gallbladders out or hernias repaired. Exactly. You do have waiting systems. 
But then it still begs the question, and I'm not a defender of the Canadian system, and I'm not a defender of the UK system. In fact, the Canadian system's under stress right now because they perceive they're spending too much, and they're looking at more privatized systems. Actually, I'm spending a fair amount of time now traveling literally the world giving talks on privatized healthcare systems because more and more countries are moving into privatized healthcare. I've done a lot of lecturing in Latin America. They want me to go to Holland next, in the next couple of months to do some lecturing over there on, on privatization of healthcare. It's a big issue. But having said that, when you look at these figures, which are indicators of health, your indicators are still seeing that for all we do in terms of the technology, it does not necessarily translate into health. And yes, you do have these ends of one, and I, again, do not discount them at all, that saying, yes, people have to wait, but the question still is, and the net effect of it, when you're looking at the health of that society, is that causing detriments in health? And also realize we wait in our society as well. Is that that's just that most of us here maybe, and I am one of them, don't have to wait because I have a good health care plan. But if you don't have a, such a good health care plan, you can conceivably have to wait a long, long time.